The first rebuttal session will be a 15 minutes each rebuttal. Hassan will go first to the bill. Then there, Hassan will give a counter rebuttal, which will last eight minutes. And then finally, uh, another eight minute counter rebuttal. Then after that, inshallah, we will have a question and answer session, which is quite important. So you can all comment or ask questions. After that will be a closing statement, five minutes each. Okay, let's begin. So I'll ask Basim to give his 15 minute rebuttal, please. Okay. All right. So according to my according to my notes, Nabil either takes a narration, makes a mountain pole, uh, a mountain out of a molehill with it. He mentioned one red herring. He appealed to one weak source. In two cases, he imposed his personal beliefs and ignored Islamic teachings regarding the issue. He appealed to two narrations and gave misleading interpretations to them. He commits one double standard, appeals to two faulty translations, mishandled two narrations, and he appeals to one narration and lacks consideration of the historical context and commits one factual error. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> All right, now let's start. Making a mountain out of a molehill. Let's start with a goat ate a verse. Uh, a goat ate a verse from the Quran right after the Prophet's death. As for the goat eating it, how on earth does that prove anything? Did the goat also eat the memories of the companions of the prophets who memorized those verses? Was that the only hard copy that the several scribes of the Prophet had those verses written on? Plus, we already know what the verse of stoning is, despite its recital abrogation and despite a goat eating up a paper that contains the verse. Also, notice the inconsistency. Nabil Qureshi argues that Umar bin Khattab, way after the Prophet's death, tried to introduce the verse of stoning into the Quran. But I thought it was lost shortly after the Prophet's death, according because the goat ate it. So his argument is very weak here. It's as silly as me saying, hey Nabil, when I was in the eighth grade, my dog ate my biology homework. Doesn't that mean that it's impossible for you to have studied biology properly and become a proper doctor? So. If you have a cough, don't go to Nabil because my dog ate my biology homework in eighth grade. <laughs> All right, red herrings. He's saying, well, are these obligated texts part of the eternal Quran that Allah uttered? The reason why I say that this is a red herring is because he's giving a theological objection. This has nothing to do with the historical inquiry of the preservation of the Quranic text. It doesn't matter if you don't like the way Islam teaches the Quran has been preserved. That's not what we're debating about. We can make that in a, in a different debate. You could title it, well, is the Islamic concept of preservation logically coherent? But it's irrelevant. But, so you won't say I'm escaping it. Let me, let me address it anyways. I'll say yes, these obligated texts are part of the uncreated Quran. Muslims believe that Allah's speech is his attribute and that his attributes are eternal since he's eternal. However, when we say that Allah's speech is eternal, we mean that it is eternal in existence, not in application. Even if the verse in the Qur'an that states that I have to fast in the month of Ramadan is uncreated, it doesn't follow that it is eternal in application, since after the Day of Judgment, I don't have to fast anymore. Furthermore, it doesn't actually mean that they have to be eternal here on earth. How could that be even when the earth itself is not eternal? So even if Allah were to abrogate or cancel out some of this speech, it's not a cancellation of its existence, but a cancellation of its application here on planet Earth, which itself is not eternal. So certain verses of the Quran may be abrogated here on Earth while they are still there in a preserved tablet. So it's a red hearing. Don't respond to it. Let's not get philosophical. Let's stick to the historical uh, issue. Um, appealing to weak sources. He appealed to a narration in Ibn Abi Dawood, uh, that, that said uh, that, said that uh, during the Battle of Yanama, some people died and the verses were lost with them. Now, he said that he really respects Abu Ammar Yasir Qadi and he likes that book. In that book, Abu Ammar Yasir Qadi is saying, from Kitab al Masahif, the source that he appealed to, you have to examine whether the Isnad is authentic or not. And in this narration, it's not. First, it's a more sad hadith which means that there's a gap in the chain of transmission, and we don't know if it's a reliable narrator that fills that gap or not. Secondly, it contains Yunus, Yunus bin Yazid, who has been criticized for making mistakes. 
Third, it contradicts a more authentic narration from the Sahih Bukhari, where we see that Umar bin Khattab said that he was worried about the Qur'an becoming lost with the deaths that occurred in, in Yaman. So the narrator Yazid, by mistake, probably said that those who uniquely memorized some of the Qur'an died in Yamama, while he should have said that there was a fear of this happening. Fourth, we already know that people like Zayd bin Thabit memorized the entire Qur'an, yet did not die in the battle of Yamama. So he could have easily recovered what was lost. Imposing personal beliefs and ignoring Islamic teachings. He said, well, and, uh, <laughs> and um, I mean, he, mis he misrepresented me, but he's saying, I said it's okay that synonyms could come and distort the issue, of, and I said no such thing. The narration said, each mode is sufficiently health-giving, whether you utter all hearing, all knowing, or it said all powerful, all wise. He said, well, these are not synonyms. Okay, I'm not going to blame you because I probably said my opening statement a bit too quick, but I said that there's also an opinion where different combinations of words could be used in order to imply a similar meaning. So I said that. And what is the most important thing here if you are a Muslim? The Prophet said, each mode is sufficiently health-giving. The Prophet is saying that it's okay. What more do you want as a Muslim? Um, uh, secondly, the, the Quran states, uh, that when the Prophet was in Mecca, when the Prophet was in Mecca, a verse came down, Surah 10, verses 15 to 16. It's telling, it's saying, Say, O Muhammad, it is not for me to change it of my accord. I only follow that which is inspired of me. Because the Quraysh in Mecca used to tell the Prophet Muhammad, change the Quran, we don't like what it says. And the verse came down saying, no, I can't change it. So if the Prophet was willing to tamper with the Quranic revelation, why didn't he do it for his enemies and avoid persecution? Which would have made more sense than doing it for his companions who were already loyal to him. It doesn't make sense. Thirdly, if the companions understood that it was up to them to choose their own words and synonyms, then we would have found dozens of variants on the same verse and would have seen them putting it into practice. Fourthly, as Mustafa al-Azami states on page 162 of his book, The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation, this was mainly intended as a relief for the companions for ease of memorization so that they won't get discouraged from, from uh, reciting from memory. Uh, the Surah 92 variant, uh, the one with uh, Abu Darda. As Ibn Hajab explains, this recitation was not transmitted except through those mentioned here and everybody else recited by the creation of male and female. And this is the established recitation, despite the authentic chain of transmissions of transmit of transmitters of the other recitation of, of Abu Darda and those mentioned with him. He goes on to say. This is, uh, he goes on to say that later on, Abu Darda transmitted his reading, and uh, as I said in my opening statement, we have Ibn Mas'ud's reading through three different chains, which show them reciting Surah 92 exactly how we are today. So how do we explain that one? I would say that it's probably due to his previous reading according to the Hadith of Hudayn. And then later on, Ibn, uh, Ibn Mas'ud agreed with the Uthmanic text and started reciting it accordingly. Um, he was trying to shock everyone here, saying Ibn Mas'ud only believed, uh, he didn't believe that Surah Al-Fatiha was from the Qur'an, he didn't believe that Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas not from the Qur'an. I have to divide my responses into two here. First issue is about Surah 1, then I'm going to talk about Surahs 113 and 114. About Surah 1, first of all, none of the narrations that I looked at state that Ibn Mas'ud did not consider Surah 1 to be part of the Qur'an. The narrations only state that he did not have them written down in his codex. Secondly, it is impossible to believe that Ibn Mas'ud did not believe that Surah 1 was part of the Qur'an when it is compulsory for every Muslim to recite it as a first Surah in his prayer. Thirdly, there are possible explanations for why Ibn Mas'ud did not include Surah 1 in his codex. 3rd century Islamic scholar Ibn Qutayba in his book that we Mashkad al-Qur'an hypothesized that Ibn Mas'ud didn't write down Surah 1 in order to make clear that there is no doubt that this Surah would ever be lost because it's recited in every prayer. And therefore Ibn Mas'ud was stressing on this point by not even bothering to include it in his, in his manuscript. Furthermore, there's a narration where someone asked Ibn Mas'ud why he didn't include Surah 1 in his manuscript. He replied back and said if he were to do so, then he would have to write it in front of every Surah. So here it seems that Ibn Mas'ud didn't write it out of convenience in order to avoid writing it over a hundred times. He probably felt that he needed to write it before every surah since it is recited before a surah in, in prayer. 
This is how a Kortobin's commentary also explained the issue. Fourthly, even if, let's assume for the sake of argument, to make Nabil happy, even if Ibn Masur denied Surah 1, his opinions to be rejected. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, La salata la kitab, which means there is no prayer except with a recitation of the opening chapter of the book, which is Surah 1. And he is obviously a much higher authority than Ibn Masur. Now, let's talk about Surahs 113 and 114. Okay, I'm going to admit, the narrations that talk about Ibn Mas'ud not, uh, not believing in Surahs 113, 114 being part of the Qur'an, I'm going to admit that they are authentic. Some of the scholars try to declare them as a fabrication, but many of the other scholars said that is not academic honesty. So I'm going to grant, I'm going to grant it, he did hold this position. But the question is, did he die insisting upon this position? It appears that Ibn Mas'ud did not die upon this position. We don't know when Ibn Mas'ud held the position that Surahs 113 and 114 were not part of the Qur'an. However, we do know what his final recitation was. As I said, his reading was transmitted through three different chains, and they include Surah 113 and 114. Thirdly, there are possible explanations for why Ibn Mas'ud did not include Surahs 113 and 114 in his codex. And that's because he saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, reciting them as incantations for his grandchildren, and he never heard the Prophet reciting them in his prayer. So he thought that they were part of the Qur'an. Fourthly, again, to make Nabil happy, let's assume Ibn Mas'ud died believing Surah 113 and 114 were not part of the Qur'an. We already have direct proof from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, that these two surahs are surahs from the Qur'an. Refer to Sunan Abu Dawood, Book 8, Hadith Numbers 1419 and 1457. So again, why would I take Ibn Mas'ud over Prophet Muhammad? And this is all with the, all with the, for the sake of argument, we're assuming that Ibn Masul did deny it. He, Nabil said the Qur'an has an escape clause for any of his mistakes or variants. He's saying, oh, so if the Muslims, so if the Muslims see any variants, they could conveniently brush it aside and say, oh, it's due to the seven Akhruf. First of all, if the existence of the Akhruf is proven and its meaning is understood, from the strongest opinion, then whether one calls this explanation an escape clause or plausible, the fact is this explanation is valid and proven to be so. Secondly, Muslim scholars don't simply attribute any variance to the seven Ahruf when, whenever they feel like it. The variance may be due to scribal errors or marginal notes added to the codex. An expert in the field of Quranic sciences and recitation is qualified to distinguish between these kinds of variants. One has to know Arabic very well, the dialects of the, er uh, of the Arabs, Quranic commentary, science of hadith, the science of Quran in order to know how to distinguish between variants and whether they are due to ahruf, marginal notes, scribal errors, abrogated verses, etc. For example, Abdul Aziz Rabah in his book, Al Hujjad al Qurra al Sama, the evidence for the seven readings, discusses in extreme detail every single verse that has variants and illustrates where, where these variants came from and due to what reason. So no, it's not just a convenient escape clause. Uh, there, there has to be evidence put forth for any claim. Double standards. Nabil said, you cannot prove preservation because the manuscripts were destroyed before uh, man's time. Let me get five points. On my fifth point, I'll say why this is doing a double standard. First, the statement overlooks the fact that these destroyed manuscripts were the basis for the automatic copies. Why do we need to compare our copies today with the pre authmatic ones when the pre authmatic ones themselves were the basis for what we have today? Secondly, the ones who burned these pre authmatic manuscripts were none other than the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, who were experts in Quranic memorization, recitation, and dictation, and their work was accepted by all Muslims. Furthermore, they were pious Muslims, so it's not like they, they were burned by people seeking to destroy the Quranic text and had bad motives. Thirdly, we have a very good idea of what kind of variants there were that existed before of man's revision through commentaries and narrations and Fogg's palimpsest. Nabil just showed it to us. We have an idea of what was uh, destroyed before, before of man's standardization. Fourthly, Muslims already admit that what we have today does not resemble 100% the pre-Othmanic copies. We already admit that many of the pre-Othmanic copies were different due to the seven Akrof and that Uthman had to produce a text in a way that allowed as much of the seven Akhruf as possible. Fifthly, Christians who pose this argument are being inconsistent, since they have no visual historical evidence of the New Testament until 125 AD, P52, and that's only for a very small fraction of the Gospel of John. 
Christians have no visual historical evidence for the early period. And this is crucial because in the early period, that's where New Testament scholars said that was where most of the variants occurred. Refer to D.C. Parker, Bruce Metzger and Mark Ehrman, Charles B. Wheeler, and many other scholars. So the earliest, uh, the earliest one minute text that you have for the New Testament is 125 years away. Appealing to faulty translations. Okay, let's see if I have time. Right. He showed you a statement for Ibn Omar, where Ibn Omar say, let none of you say I have acquired the whole of the Qur'an. How does he know what all of it is when much of it has disappeared? Dr. Jibreel Fuad Haddad clarifies what this narration actually means. He says, the above refers to a famous saying of Ibn Omar, once again, deceptively, ignorantly mistranslated so as to mislead readers to think that it means something actual other than its actual meaning. How many, how many seconds? I know. Okay, I'm going to save this rebuttal for the next one. Good idea. Right. Good idea. Okay. Did they only have 15 minutes? Sorry, what would it be? Hope. Yeah, hope. Yeah. Change. Take a hope. Okay, another brief right? extremely fast, and I hope that I can cover as much as he covered. Um, I want to start off by reiterating my question, Wassam. I'm really interested in understanding at what point do you say the Quran has not been perfectly preserved? What do I have to show you to say the Quran has not been perfectly preserved? Uh, it's an extremely important question for me. Uh, it seems like it's different for everyone, because any general Muslim I'd ask, would, I'd say, how do I know the Quran has not been perfectly preserved? They'd say, show me one very, and, I, and we've seen many. Or they'd say, show me one that's been propagated, and i show you that. Or well, they'd say, show me a difference in chapters, and I showed that. So it's what is the, what do you want? What do you want to show that this Qur'an has not been perfectly preserved? That's what I want to see. It seems like you're including everything that could possibly happen in the Qur'an as something that is okay. I'm going to go back to um, the uh, stuff you said in your opening statement that I didn't get to respond to, um, or that you haven't responded to. You said, uh, in order for parts of the Qur'an to be accepted into the Qur'an, it had to be documented, and there had to be eyewitnesses or people who had it memorized, etc., to confirm that. Please show me where that was written. Uh, I want to see where it said that the Qur'an had to be found in writing and then confirmed, because everything I've seen says the Qur'an just had to be there, and the rest of ours counts just as well as writing. He says, um, well, I already talked about that. All right, he talks about skeptic revisionist theories, uh, how they've been discarded. What are those skeptic revisionist theories that have been discarded? Are they the ones that I'm proclaiming? No, the skeptic theories that have been discarded are things such as, oh, the Qur'an was first written in Syriac, uh, or the Qur'an was written hundreds of years after Muhammad died. Those are the theories that have been discarded. The things that I'm saying have not been discarded. Lots of scholars still hold on to the things that I'm saying. He's making it sound as if I'm holding on to some fringe view. That's simply not the case. The modern scholarship in uh, textual criticism of the Qur'an espouses much of what I've said, and they even go much further than what I say. Uh, he talks about Fogg's palimpsest, and he says, uh, this does not reveal a variant text. Uh, again, the point I have for bringing up Fogg's palimpsest is to show that Muhammad's best teacher of the Qur'an disagreed with today's Qur'an. Why is that? I mean, doesn't this provoke some thought? Muhammad's best chosen teacher saying, the Qur'an you have today is not the Qur'an that Muhammad revealed? If his best teacher doesn't know what it is, how can we expect other people to know what it is? Bassam says that many people have the Qur'an memorized, and therefore they're going to compare it back and forth uh, between what they already knew and what they had written. According to Yasser Qadhi on page 128 of his book, only four people had the Qur'an memorized. Just four, and that's according to Yasser Qadhi, and he quotes Sayyid Bukhari on this. So it seems here that Bassam is, is using ideas and concepts that have been propagated through, uh, through tradition, but not necessarily found in the earliest manuscripts. Well, what I have to ask then is, what does it mean when a whole bunch of people who had memorized the Qur'an died in the Battle of Imam? 
Uh, well, it seems to me that the best explanation of this is that a whole bunch of people who knew the Quran extremely well uh, died in Babel Imam. When you say memorized, we have, according to Yasir Qadi, a hadith from Bukhari, which contradicts that. Can mean memorize the whole thing. Only four people had the whole thing memorized. So what does it mean? I think it simply means people who knew it extremely well. If people had it memorized, again, if people had it memorized, just as Basam, Basam asserts, then why the hubbub with uh, making sure that certain scholars get together to write it down the first time and then to edit it later, why all that to do? If everyone had it memorized, why not just get one person to write it down and go check it with multiple people? That simply did not happen. He says, uh, the earliest manuscripts contain the first and last chapters of the Quran. Of course they were included. Uh, what he did not tell you is that of the catalog manuscripts we have in the first century, only one includes the first surah. Only one. Another one contains part of the last verse of the first, first surah. That's it. Nothing more than that. So if you want seven verses of the first surah, only one catalog manuscript has that. And another man, uh, manuscript has part of a verse. Not the whole thing. Um, he goes on and talks about, well, of course, Ibn Masud must have believed it was part of the Qur'an. Uh, he must have just been emphasizing that everyone knew it, and that's why he didn't include it. That is an ad hoc statement. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine anyone using that statement about another book and Muslims accepting it. Oh, he knew it so well that he didn't bother showing that he knew it. That, that doesn't apply, and that logic just simply does not work. He says, Abu Dawood, Surah Abu Dawood grants uh, Surah 113 and 114. Uh, I haven't read this. Uh, I'm sincerely asking you to just read it for me so that I know what it is. And if that is the case, then uh, uh, I, will, I will accept it. Now, when you talk about Ibn Abi Dawood and you say, oh, well, here it says that people uh, irretrievably lost parts of the Quran, and you're saying, well, that probably meant that people had thought, or, or he thought people may have lost the Quran. Well, now you're imposing words on the text that simply isn't there. You're assuming it says something which it simply does not say. The text is very clear, and it adds threefold emphasis to the fact that, hey, things have been lost. Uh, to, to simply insert your own words into that meaning is, I would say, uh, distorting what it says. Now, speaking of distortion, you said, I distorted what you claimed at the beginning of your speech. You said the words, if Muhammad were alive, he would say, no chapter or verse is falsely added to or missing from the Quran. That was your definition of variance. He's you're saying, basically we're trying to prove that no verse has been added to or chapter has been added to or missing from the Quran. But some, I'm not distorting what you say. The logical outpouring of that is that you're allowing verses which distort the meaning. That's not included in your definition. If you want to include that, please revise your definition. But we showed from chapter 3, verse 128, that we have variants which say, well, surely, versus, well, surely not. A clear distortion of the meaning. In fact, this isn't the only case where this happens. Uh, Islamic Awareness, which is um, a site, of, a very scholarly Muslim site. Again, when I say scholarly, by the way, I don't mean I agree with everything they say. I mean they're doing their homework well. Um, but a very scholarly Muslim site says about uh, about these uh, variants, uh, they say that the variants affect meaning, can affect meaning, but not the overall Islamic thought. Uh, I'm going to try to pull this up while I'm talking. I mean, I talk slower. But here's what they're espousing. They're espousing this concept, that the variants that we find in the manuscripts may be uh, something that goes against what the verse actually says. It may change the meaning in the local context. But because of Islamic thought, we know what the original verse actually said. We know that it doesn't affect uh, Islamic thought. That's a, that's a concession from Islamic awareness. Um, I think that's a powerful concession. What are they saying? They're saying there are no changes in the Quran that can't be undone based on what we know about Islamic thought. Well, fine. I agree with that. I have no problem with that statement whatsoever. But what that inevitably means is that the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved in this manner where we think no words have been changed, or even that words have been changed but not to where they affect the meaning. He's saying if meaning can be affected, but not necessarily the whole meaning of Islamic thought. Guess what? That's what people say about the Bible, by the way. He's, he started talking about the New Testament, and I'll make a parallel here as well. People say the same thing about the Bible. There's no variant in the Bible that affects the meaning of Christian thought. And now we have Islamic awareness saying the same thing about the Qur'an. That is my point. And Basam, I want to make this abundantly clear. I'm not trying to say the Qur'an is horribly corrupt, and there's no way we can know what was originally said. I'm not trying to say, oh, the Qur'an is so messed up, we, we just can't trust it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the Qur'an went through the same process of revision and addition that every book goes through. 
There are variants in there. Chapters were discussed. Some were included, some weren't. Verses, some were included, some weren't. Individual verses, sometimes we have wills versus will nots. Words, orthographical changes. Every single change we can find in any other book is found in the Quran. There's just a method here by which Muslims say, oh, Allah allows for this. Well, great, you can believe that if you want, but I'm not questioning whether you think Allah allows for that. I'm questioning if this is textually preserved in any significant way other than any other book. And like the Psalm has been admitting, no, these changes, abrogations, verses that have been taken out, verses that have been deleted, little verses that have differences in wills and will nots, these things have happened in every book and have happened in the Quran, uh, according to everyone on stage agrees with this. Now, Hassan says, I've been espousing double standards. Um, why need to compare uh, these various verses when um, they were the basis? In other words, when Uthman burnt the Quran, why need to compare any of the previously distinct verses when those verses were the basis off which the modern Quran exists? In other words, he's saying, well, of course the modern Quran is based off those Qurans, so why do you need to compare them if they were burnt? Who cares? What that implies is that the Qur'an, the modern Qur'an, is exactly the same as the earlier Qur'ans, so who cares? You don't need to compare them. But no, we know they're not exactly the same. If they were exactly the same, they wouldn't have been burnt. So his assertion works both ways. It's a double-edged sword. He's saying, why need to compare them? Of course they were the same. No, they're not the same. We know that um, from what the text said. So, um, he said so much. I hope that if, if I miss anything, it's not because I'm trying to miss it. Just bring it back up and I'll address it in the next point. I want to, I want to go back over my case, things that he didn't address during my case. First, we know that during the Qur'an, uh, during the process of giving the Qur'an, we had transmissions, we had uh, various readings, and we had various modes. Understand this. There's seven ahruf, seven modes. What are they? No one knows. Uh, but there's seven different modes. And beyond that, there are ten different qirat, ten different dialects within which the Qur'an could have been presented. What are the exact dialects? Well, some people have an account with their disagreements about the dialects, but there's ten of them. And then there's different transmissions. There's the Huff's transmission, the Wadsh tra transmission, there's more transmissions. So you have different transmissions, different modes, and you have different recitations. Well, what does someone mean when they come up and say only one version of the Qur'an? Obviously they're different modes, obviously they're different recitations, obviously they're different transmissions. You have 95% of the Muslim world reading one thing, 3% reading another, 1% in Yemen reading another. So, I, I'm just trying to point out the simple fact that the Qur'an is like every other book in this regard. I'm not saying it's ridiculously corrupted, I'm just saying it's, in every other, it's just like every other book. There's various lines of transmission, there are various words that can be agreed upon and not agreed upon. We have the evidence before us. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that every level that you can check for variants, we find variants. Were there pre uthmanic variants? Yes, Basan has admitted that the Ibn Masud variant found in the Fog's palimpsest was pre uthmanic So before Uthman's time, people disagreed with the modern version of the Qur'an. And was it just some random person? No, it was the best teacher of the Qur'an. So that's pre uthmanic And what about post uthmanic Well, we have many records of post uthmanic uh, variations. Like I showed you, we have two full charts of uh, the Tashkent versus Topkapi variants. So we have variants there. We have a variant found in the Paris manuscript. In fact, uh, I've gotten this from a scholar who told me to keep him off record, but he said, if you can show in the first 300 years any manuscript that perfectly matches today's Cairo text, please show it. The fact of the matter is, there is no text that matches perfectly the Quran that most people read today for the first 300 years, not one. Now, the variations might be minor, but there's still variations there. What's the point I'm trying to make? It's horribly flawed? No, it has minor variations that happen in the Bible, that happen in other books. That's all I'm trying to show. And I think the psalm is leaning towards agreeing with me here. I've got three more minutes. Um, I, I want to emphasize the following, and then I'll, I'll relinquish back to the psalm. What does one mean when the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved? No chapter or verse has been falsely added to or missing from the Qur'an. That's the Psalm's quotation. We know that of Muhammad's earliest four teachers, we had disagreements on the chapters to include. He says that one chapter 1 obviously must be included by Ibn Musul, but every record we have shows that he did not include it. He says 113 and 114. He admits 113 and 114 were disagreed upon by Abdullah Ibn Musul. He then says that later in life, Abdullah ibn Masood included it. I think that if 
Uthman, the Khalifa, comes up to you and says, look, you are causing division within the people. I don't care what you believe. At this point, you need to show that you are on our side or you are a dissident against Islam. Uh, that kind of pressure can make a man say, okay, I agree. But what was his first inclination? What was his scholarly inclination? What was the inclination that he recorded and propagated to his students? That there was no chapter 113 and 114 in the Quran. And I would also like to see if those uh, records... Uh, which you quote saying that he ultimately did include them, were early. I have no doubt that people later probably said that. Uh, but I want to see early records where uh, Ibn Masood included those. So, he says, Muhammad, were, if Muhammad were alive, he would say no chapter or verse has been falsely added to or missing from the Quran. We know two out of the four teachers disagreed with a number of chapters, so he's already wrong there. No verse. We have records of hundreds of verses missing from Surah 33 uh, that should be there. We have records of the verse of stoning. Omar says it should be included. We have records of uh, the verse of suckling. Aisha says it should be included. What about stuff that's included that shouldn't be? We have verses from Khuzayma that says that he was the only one who knew verses of the Quran. So it wasn't with the lot there. That shouldn't be included. One minute. So in essence, every single criteria he has provided fails. Chapters, disagreements. Verses, disagreements. And I'd say even that uh, definition falls horribly short because it allows for distortion within verses. And we find distortion within verses. So, just to pose it back to you, Bassam, um, I just really want to hear, what is it that makes the Qur'an perfectly, if there's something that would make it not perfectly preserved, please show that, or tell me what that is, and uh, show me the early sources for these things that you were asserting, not late sources from late commentators, but early sources uh, from within the first few centuries of Islam. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, I still have seven arguments left for his opening statement to address, but let me just comment on a few things he just said right now. Regarding uh, that Sahih Bukhari narration does not say that only four people had memorized the Qur'an. It says in the Arabic, only four did jama' of the Qur'an. And jama' in the Qur'anic sciences can mean two things, either bringing the Qur'an together orally or in one's mind, or bring it together in written form or in a book. And uh, Ahmed von Denfer gives five different ways of how to understand Jem and Quran. So it doesn't clearly state that uh, only four people have uh, memorized it. He said if everyone had memorized it, why did they bother uh, to write it down? I, I never said that everyone had the Quran fully memorized. There were still a few memorizers left, but because the Muslims were engaging in war, you never knew what would have happened, so they wanted to take uh, more precaution. Um, you said my, uh, the, the Ibn Masud's explanations on Fatiha are ad hoc, but at the end of the day I did say, Prophet Muhammad said that Fatiha is a revelation of the Qur'an. And who did you use to appeal to Ibn Masud? You're like, Prophet Muhammad said Ibn Masud is one of the four best reciters. But Prophet Muhammad said Fatiha is from the Qur'an, so you should accept what Prophet Muhammad said. Ibn Masud, you saying, uh, uh, granting 113 114. Uh, we have, uh, for our 10 Qur'an, we do have a multiple chains of transmission. We have the Isnads showing that, and for three of his readings, we do have that in Surah 113 114 uh, is there. And even Imam al Baqalani Ibn Hazm said, today we recite the reading of Ibn Mas'ud, and it's exactly as we have it today. He said that I distorted the narration uh, from, Ibn Abi da from Ibn Abi Dawood on Yabama. Uh, I won't blame you because I was speaking fast. No, what I said was that the narration is weak and that the authentic narration, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari, says that there, that there was a fear of this happening. So that's what I said. Um, you're like, Hafs uh, and Wash, various lines of transmission. Th that's what my whole opening statement was about. In Islam, we believe in textually inspired variants. The Qira'at and the Hafs and Wajh, they all go back to Prophet Muhammad's time. The companions recited it that way. They he approved of it. These variants are inspired, we believe in them, and these variants are inspired, and we believe in them. That's the whole point. Why do you think I was admitting that there are variants? Because I believe that they're all from God. I, that's why I spent all my time explaining what seven Ahruf were. 
You're like, uh, no, my theories have not been discarded. Well, who I was quoting was Angelica Newworth, one of Germany's most renowned Quranic experts, and right after she said that, she said, new findings of Quranic fragments, moreover, could be adduced to affirm, rather call into question, the traditional picture of the Quran as an early fixed text composed of the surahs we have. Do you agree with Angelica? Now let me go back to some of the arguments in your opening statement. I'm still on the fallacy appealing to faulty trans translations. Uh, regarding, he's saying that Ibn, uh, Ibn Omar said some of the Quran has been lost. Dr. Jibri Fuad Haddad says that this, that this is a very faulty translation. The words, he says, the words used by Ibn Omar for the terms given as acquired, disappeared, and what has survived above were, respect, were respectively ahatu, fatahu, umatayassara minhu. The actual meaning of Ibn Omar's words is let one say I, let no one say I've encompassed the whole of the Quran, meaning its meanings. How does how does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran escapes him? Rather, let him say I have encompassed whatever amount of it has been facilitated for me to know. He was not referring to the collection of the Quran, but only to the ethics of the exegete. And I agree with Jibril Fahad that after looking at the Arabic text, I think this is the the better translation. Another narration where he appeared, where he appealed to a faulty translation. It's in regards to the narration that he cited for you, where Ibn Mas'ud told the people of Iraq to refuse giving in uh, their manuscripts to, uh, to, to not copy the manuscripts of Uthman. Ibn Mas'ud said, avoid copying the Mus'haf and recitation of this man. It's a faulty translation. The Arabic word is actually Urzal. And it actually, the whole phrase actually means, I am exempted from writing down the Mus'haf and it's assigned to a man. What Ibn Mas'ud is really talking about is that Uthman did not choose me to be part of the committee and instead it, uh, Zayd, someone else was selected. He's talking about Zayd in context. So again, I don't blame Nabil. Uh, I think this is a horrible translation. I don't blame him. But when you really look at the Arabic, it is not saying that. And if Ibn Mas'ud was trying to say that, he would have used the word I'tazilu and uh, not follow it with a preposition. Um, mishandling the narration. Omar and the verse of stoning. Okay, first of all, nowhere does Omar bin Khattab say that the verse of stoning wasn't abrogated and that it's still, part of the, it's still considered part of the Quranic text. Secondly, Omar's statement indirectly shows that he believed that the narration was abrogated. Look, he says, I'm afraid that after a long time has passed, people may say, we do not find the verses of stoning to death in the holy book. What he was afraid of was that in the future, people who are, are going to come and they're going to say, since the ruling is not found in the Quran, that means we don't have to abide by it. And surely we do have these kind of Muslims today, especially if they are Quran-only Muslims and they reject hadith. That, that is one of the wisdoms behind uh, uh, abrogation of the recitation of the text and keeping its legal rulings, testing those who want to abide by the sunnah. So why didn't Omar say, I'm afraid in the future people will say we don't find the verses of punishing the thief in the Quran. Why didn't he say that about anything else? That's because he knew the verse of stoning was abrogated. And if he really did believe those part of the Quran, how come when he was second caliph, he didn't force, that, he didn't force the people to include it back into the Quran? Al-Hafid al Khan, this is important. He said that uh, Ubay bin Ka'ab believed in two extra surahs. First of all, none of the narrations say that if Ubay believed that Hafid al Khan were surahs, none of them. Secondly, these two alleged surahs are known to be supplications, dua, due to other narrations that we have, uh, dua al Qunut. Uh, third, thirdly, the companions were known for including text in their codices, even though they didn't believe it was inspired. This shouldn't come as a surprise to Christians like Nabil, who have no problem believing that uninspired books like the Shepherd of Herpes or the Epistle of Barnabas were part of Codex Sinaiticus. Fourthly, this is the crucial part, Ubay was part of the committee appointed by Uthman. And we don't see him arguing with the other members of the committee that these two so alleged surahs should be included into the Uthmanic text. Surely if you believe that these surahs were not abrogated and inspired by Allah, then we would expect to have some record of him disputing with the of other members in the committee. And we know that he did not, even if we assume that he did believe that those two Hafid al-Khan were surahs, we know he didn't die upon it because we have his reading transmitted to us through Nafi' ibn Kathir and Abu Amro, and they do not include the Hafid al-Khan.
eight minutes counter rebuttal. All right, this is great. Uh, we're covering a lot of ground. There's a lot of stuff that's being discussed here that I've never seen discussed before, so it's really good. I really, really, really would like you to tell me, Hassan, what constitutes the Quran not being perfectly preserved? Um, I asked, this is I think my fourth time asking, um, and uh, my first few times, I guess, uh, I just figured you'd respond to it at some point. Um, but now I'm really interested. Um, this means a lot. At what point does the Quran become not perfectly preserved? Please, please tell me, otherwise I'm going to have to assume that you're just avoiding the question. Um, I'm going back to some of the stuff you stated that I didn't get to respond to. Um, you said, uh, doesn't the abrogation, the, you said abrogation, uh, changing the word of God, so that doesn't matter. You said it doesn't matter um, what you say about abrogation, it's part of Islam and it's okay. Um, I say no, there is a big problem, because according to the Islamic theology, there should be perfect preservation. Um, and the reason this applies is because the idea of perfect preservation has to be consistent. Um, and in Islamic theology, there's a tablet of, of the Quran in heaven, um, and I, I assume that you expect the definition of perfect preservation, since you haven't shared it with me yet, uh, including what would disprove it, I'm assuming that you would include this concept of the tablet in heaven. Uh, unless you explicitly deny that, please let me know. Um, but if you're going with the Quran here, and there's a tablet in heaven, uh, which, which can show what the text of the Quran is, how could it be possible that both the abrogated and the unabrogated verses are all in there? You said there's an eternality of, of the words, not the eternality of application. Um, well, once you, once you show that the Quran, if the Quran and the tablet of heaven has eternality of the words, then the words are still there in that Quran and not in the Quran today. They're not considered or revered as words of God. So you have a problem here. Uh, it's related because it talks about the preservation. Now, I also want to mention this. This is extremely interesting. I mentioned uh, a hadith uh, where Ubayyah bin Qab shows that there is uh, two statements, life-giving and all-hearing, uh, life, I'm sorry, all-powerful and all-hearing uh, versus all-knowing, etc. He says, well, both of these are equally health-giving, and therefore they fall under the same ahruf. Well, what gives him the right to say that the ahruf are just how much health is given by these verses? Uh, where, where does he have that statement? Um, it doesn't seem like any of the early scholars said anything of that nature. And now it seems the criterion of preservation is not based on words. It's not based on what's actually written. It's based on the health-giving factor. Uh, this just doesn't fit with anything we're talking about with preservation. He takes offense when I talk about Surah 92. Um, he's saying it's authentic, but it's Ahad. Basically, it's only shown uh, by Ibn Masud and those people who were talking about it in the Hadith. Uh, don't forget... Um, this is where Abu Dhabda says, tell me how Ibn Masood reads the beginning of Surah 92. Ibn Masood read it differently, and Abu Dhabda says, that's how I read it. He says, yes, this is authentic, but it's just one person. They could be mistaken. Can you, do you hear what he's saying? Do you hear what he's conceded? The early best companions and the best teacher of the Quran can be mistaken on what the Quran actually taught. So I, I just take issue with this concept that everyone uh, knew the Quran extremely well to the point where there was no real dissension. Uh, he's saying not everyone knew it perfectly. Okay, good. I'm glad he's conceded that. But I'm telling you, in important ways, ways that meant things to people, the best of the companions disagreed on the Quran, and they disagreed together, which shows that there was real problems there. Ultimately, what cannot be um, argued is that the words here were exactly the same. Everyone knew them. Uh, he has to concede that certain people didn't know, and he has to concede that those were the teachers. That's my biggest point, and he's conceded that. But I think he hasn't realized the full scope of what he's saying. That if the earliest people and the best people didn't know what was part of the Quran, we got problems. Um, talking about uh, Abu Dawud, you said uh, it grants Surah 113 and 114. I don't, I don't think you're lying. I don't think you're being deceptive. But I just want to hear it. I just want to hear this indeed. If you don't mind sharing it, I want to hear where Abu Dawud uh, says Surah 113 and 114 was granted. Also, with Muhammad, you said Muhammad granted um, the uh, Surah al Fatiha. I find that extremely interesting. I wasn't able to find that. If I were able to find it, I would modify my argument some. So if you could please share that as well. Uh, where did Muhammad say Surah Al-Fatiha was granted? And even if Muhammad did say that, you still have the same problem. His chosen teacher of the Quran didn't include it. So I just want to point out, uh, well, let, me, let me continue covering this. Muhammad's statement about Fatiha I just talked about. 
fear of losing the Quran versus really lost it. He says, oh, you're narrating something where uh, it shows Ibn Omar talking about fear of losing the Quran. Whereas in Sayyid Bukhari, I'm sorry, where Ibn Omar says we've actually lost the Quran. Whereas in Sayyid Bukhari, it clarifies there was just a fear of losing the Quran. I don't think that's a clarification. I, th I think that's, uh, that's, they don't contradict each other. Now, if the two ahadith contradicted each other, one said one thing, one said another, then I would say, okay, I'll pick Sayyid Bukhari because Bukhari is renowned to be um, more, uh, more solid. However, these aren't contradicting each other. You can fear losing things and actually lose them. They're not contradictory. So I think that reconciliation doesn't work. Bassam is admitted, he says, my whole opening statement was about Hafs and Wajsh and various things that were allowed by Allah to propagate through Islam. Why didn't you get this? No, I do get that. I do get that. All I'm pointing out is that you have in the Quran various verses, various versions of the text that come down. They're not the same. People can disagree on them. People can say this one's better. Some people can say that one's better. You have various words. There is no one text. There is, it's not the same thing that's in heaven. It's not the same thing that Muslims believe that the Quran is. You have variations. He agrees. He says, oh, there's Hafs and there's words, but it's allowed by God. Okay, if that's, if that's how you want to explain it, sure, but you have to agree there's differences in these words and these texts. You conceded that. I think we agree on that. You said you were quoting Angelica. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, you were, um, I, I guess I was lying too slowly. I didn't catch the statement. If you'd like to repeat it, I'll let you know what I think about it. Um, Ibn Umar, you said no one fully understands um, what, what was being said. You quoted Ibn Umar, where Ibn Umar says, no one, uh, let no one say he has the whole Quran. And you said Ibn Omar is talking about, oh, no one fully understands it. Well, I have to disagree. The reason why is because Abu Ubay, who was the last person, in, or the first person, if you will, in that chain of transmission, specifically quoted this verse because he was talking about variants. He was talking about variants, and then he inserted this quotation about this. Um, and therefore, it's not about, uh, oh, no one had full knowledge. No, the context is talking about variants, and then he quotes this, saying not everyone has the whole Quran. So I have to disagree with you on that. One minute, everyone. You say Omar knew the verse of stoning was abrogated. If not, why didn't he force it back into the Quran? He was the Khalifa. That's my point. Omar says, this is part of the Quran. I'll see if he records him as saying, I would write it back into the Quran if I could. I don't want people to accuse me of adding to the Quran. So you've shown my point, and you showed it excellently well. Thank you for that. I think the uh, conclusion here is, I, I want to show everyone what's happening. He's making it sound as if I think the Qur'an has been horribly corrupted. It's not trustworthy in any regards. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the Qur'an is simply a book, just like every other book which has variations. It has changes, it has transmissions, it has modes, it has dialectical recitations, just like every other book does. That's all I'm trying to show. And his concessions are repeatedly agreeing with me that yes, there are different transmissions. Yes, there were pre uthmanic variants and post uthmanic variants. Yes, 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 yes is what he's saying to me. I think he's agreed with my case. Uh, uh, back to give a counter re uh, rebuttal. Um, eight minutes each, and then Nabil will finish. And then we're going to go to a Q&A session. So if you have any of your questions prepared or comments, even. Okay, right. thanks, Nabil. Okay, you want me to read out the sunnah with that one narration to you? Because this is what it says. <coughs> Uh, I was uh, Uqba narrated. I was driving the sheep camel of the apostle of Allah during the journey. He said to me, Uqba, should I not teach you two best surahs ever recited? He then taught me, say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn. That's 113. And say, I seek refuge in the Lord of men. That's 114. You told me to tell you how, how you could falsify the Quran for me. I'll give you four ways. One. So that several companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, claim that parts of the Qur'an that were meant to be part of the preserved Qur'an for future generations were lost. Two, show that several companions of the Prophet claim that non-Qur'anic editions were introduced into the Qur'an's final compilation and were accepted by the people as Qur'an. Three, show that several companions fought with each other and accused each other of tampering with the Qur'an and denying that what the other person said was Qur'anic was indeed Qur'anic. Four, show that all the companions conspired to tamper with the Qur'an and falsify passages and potential. So these are just four of many ways that you can convince me that the Qur'an has been corrupted. Um, regarding, regarding uh, you said in your opening statement that Zayd said that he only found one of the surahs with Ibn Abi Khuzayma. Okay, good, yeah. You asked me to show you proof. Uh, where did Abu Bakr say, get it documented first and then get two witnesses? 
One proof is in Ibn Hajar al-Rastalani, he, he has a narration showing that. But I'm going to be honest and say the narration is disconnected. So I'm not going to use that as my main argument. My main argument would be that Imam Layth ibn Sa'd, who lived in the first century, and Imam al-Harith al-Mahasibi, who lived in the first century as well, were two scholars who only lived a generation away and said that this is the way that the Qur'an has been compiled. So we have early testimony in the first century, that's what you wanted. Uh, and no, and further proof, from the, from the hadith itself, you can know this. How do you know this? Zid said, said, when we wrote the Holy Quran, I missed one of the verses of Surah Al-Ahzab, which I used to hear Allah's apostle reciting. Then we searched for it and found it with Khuzayma bin Thabit. Notice what the narration is saying. Zayd is already admitting that he knows about a verse that he used to recite. Then he said, we're going to go search for it. Well, why are you going to search for something that you already know? It clearly means that you want to search for it in documented form. Oh yeah, and you committed a, a gross factual error. Even though it wasn't a very big deal, but you did commit a factual error. You said that Mu'ad and uh, Ubay were dead by the time of Uthman's collection. It's not true. Mu'ad was living in Syria, and Ubay was one of the people in the committee selected by Uthman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so that's enough with all the opening statements. Okay, uh, let's start looking at some of the stuff I couldn't uh, capture. You're like, the, uh, the, the verse coming down, Surah 16107, allowed a teaching obligation, came after Muhammad allowed it. But you have to remember that Muslims believe that the Prophet received ilham, inspiration, and wahi, revelation. He could have been inspired to say such a thing before the revelation of the Qur'an. He said, Bassam doesn't take the position dialects and only synonyms. No, I take two positions. Uh, I mentioned that in my opening statement. Uh, how do I know that it's the maximum number of the Ahluf? I know this because Uthman told Zayd and, and the people in the committee, write out the Qur'an in a way so that you can maximize as much of the recitation as possible. However, if you differ with one another, then only write it in the Qurayshi. So that's why, that's my proof that it wasn't full seven Ahluf preserved, and it's my proof that only one of the Ahluf, uh, it's not only one of the Ahluf that was taken. He's like, what authority does Uthman have to destroy any of them? Does destroying the Ahruf, doesn't destroying the Ahruf mean destroying God's word? I already said that one Ahruf was good enough and that it could represent the entire Quran. Because the Prophet said, recite of it whichever you want. So we're not obliged to recite all seven. So taking one is enough for you. So even if all the Muslims in the world said, let's only recite this one half, we won't be condemned, Islamically speaking. And no, it doesn't mean you're destroying God's word because we, we already have the entire Qur'an through any of the Ahruf that we have preserved. Like, why didn't they copy Hafsa's? Why didn't they just use Abu Bakr's manuscript? Why write up the copies again? Because, uh, well, my assumption would be is because Abu Bakr uh, initially collected the Qur'an in seven Ahruf, and that's not what uh, Uthman wanted. Uh, and he said, you're distorting uh, you're saying, I said that the early companions were wrong about the Surah 92 variant. I did not say that. I said that the reason why it's different is because it was probably according to Ibn Mas'ud's old reading, according to Behu Dayal Haf. Ibn Mas'ud was reciting according to a certain Haf. Then after Uthman standardized the text, he, went, uh, he abided by the new Uthmanic text. So these narrations that Nabil is showing, Ibn Mas'ud did this and that, that was according to his old narrate, old Haf, before he agreed with Uthman. Um, he says, what gives him the right to say health giving? It's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet who said, each mode is sufficiently health giving. What the Prophet meant is that each of these seven modes is good enough. So they're inspired. We have the authority from our Prophet. What more do Muslims want? Prophet Muhammad said, it's okay. Uh, regarding the tablets, I'm not going to answer because I think it's philosophical. Uh, if I have time, I'll answer again. The, th the Surah 3, 128 distortion. I really don't know Nabil because I didn't study the variant on this specific verse. My general response to any variants that you might bring is this. First of all, are these variants present in our Qira'at? If they are, then great. That means the Prophet approved of them because we have multiple isnads of our Qira'at going back to the Prophet's time. If not, then an investigation will be done. Is it a scribal error? If it's a scribal error, and it didn't enter into our transmission, no one has recited it, and only one manuscript had it, that's probably a scribal error. Then we could brush it aside as that. Or is it, was it, did it used to be part of the seven Akhrofs? 
and then it didn't make its way through Uthman's text. So I don't know the answer on Surah 3, 128, I'll be honest with you on that, but that will be my general response, that will be the steps that I take uh, to find out. You said, okay, and you're like critical scholarship, you said uh, I have critical scholarship on my side, uh, there's one scholar I'm not going to name him. Okay, so you know, how am I going to respond back to that? So what is your critical scholarship? And what's the name of this friend of yours who's so scared of me? Um, <laughs> okay, you know what? If there's anything that you refuted, I'm going to admit this one. Yes, the because Abu Ubaid cited Ibn Umar's narration in that context, I, I'm going to admit that G.F. Haddad's model, uh, explanation is not valid. But I usually, I have a personal, uh, I personally have another explanation for that, and that what Ibn Umar was talking about was, don't say that you have the entire, every all the verses that were claimed to be Qur'an, don't say that you have them with you, because we believe in obligation. So don't say that you have collected all of the Qur'an that was meant to be uh, collected. And you said, Umar said that he wanted to add it to the Qur'an, but he said what the reason was. He said that I'm afraid that people will come in the future and say, because we don't find it in the Qur'an, we can't implement this law. He, that's what he said. He didn't say, I want to put it back in the Qur'an because people said it's obligated and I disagree with them. That's the point that you're supposed to show. Thank you. Okay, now we only have eight minutes in your final counter rebuttal. Question and answers after that, after the has finished. All right. I appreciate his response again. A lot of things have been enlightened. I especially like that he and I are both conceding points. Uh, usually, when you have debates and people just stand their ground, I've conceded various points, he's conceded various points. And I said at the beginning of the debate, I thought that was going to happen because this is a debate where none of this has really been discussed in public forum before. So I appreciate your candor and honesty. I'm glad we can move through this uh, academically with honesty. You said Abu Dawood records uh, 113 and 114 um, being uh, officially the word of the Quran. Okay, good. Thanks for, thanks for that. Um, later I'd like to get that exact source from you. I believe you would, it's there. However, it still shows that there was uh, disagreement amongst the earliest scholars, even if Ibn Masud was wrong. Let's say he was wrong, as he's asserting, and we only have one assertion that he's wrong from uh, Abu Dawood. But even if he is wrong, guess what? That's still Muhammad's greatest teacher on the Quran, disagreeing on the number of chapters. Uh, I, I may have said this like six or seven times by now, but it doesn't seem like he's willing to concede that. He hasn't said it yet. He said, yes, Ibn Masud thought that, but it was actually part of the Quran. Okay, great, so why don't you make the logical conclusion? Please just state it, Ibn Masud was wrong. The early scholars were wrong. The best early scholars were wrong. So I, I just want to hear him actually take it to that conclusion. He agrees with me, I agree with him. It's just that he's not concluding to the right point. He's talking about uh, Ibn Hijad al-Skalani um, saying uh, it was, he was the one who said, oh, you need it written. He agrees uh, that this is not good reasoning. I thank him for conceding that point. He was whom I mentioned, by the way, when I said no one said that before the 15th century. That was al Askalani, uh, who I was referring to. Then he says, but there were two scholars in the first century, just a generation apart, who said that this was documented proof. You didn't give me the source for that. I, I want to see... I'll see you. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I will look into that. Thank you for that. Then you went through the um, criteria where it stated... <coughs> Um, you said, this is what I need to be shown in order for the Qur'an to have been not perfectly preserved. You went through a killer fast, um, I only got the last two, uh, <laughs> that people fought and argued with each other, um, so the companions would fight and argue with each other, and uh, number four, um, that they falsified stuff, show that they falsified stuff intentionally. Understand what I'm saying, number four just doesn't, is not something I'm going for. I don't think anyone did any of this intentionally. The Muslims revered the Qur'an to such a high degree uh, that it's to the point where it's uh, it's almost perfect like Allah himself. I'm not saying that they deify the Quran, but it's really a high degree of reverence. Um, so I'm not saying anyone intentionally did anything. So number four, I'll just have to disagree with right off the bat. 
But number three, where you said, show me where people thought about these things, I'm showing you over and over again. Ibn Masud disagreed with people when he was told to give up the language of Qur'an. He didn't include the same chapters. Uh, he said in Tirmidhi, maintain your Qur'ans, don't go with the Musaf of Uthman. So here we have uh, someone actually meeting, not just anyone, the chief teacher of the Qur'an, meeting the exact criteria that you wanted to show the Qur'an has not been perfectly preserved. And that's my point. When you actually state these criteria, we'll be able to find uh, them being met. You said Zayd, of course, already knew the verse. Uh, that's why he searched for, um, for the presence of that verse with Kozema. I would say this. I would say, I mean, this is, a, this is a common psychological phenomenon. People can remember that there is something, but they don't know the whole details of it. For example, you could say, weren't there two more verses to the end of that surah? I know there are. I have a general idea. Let me see if I can find someone who has the exact verses. Now, the reason I can say this is because we know, historically, people forgot verses all the time. Muhammad himself is recorded in Sahih Bukhari as saying, I forgot a certain verse. It also shows in other sources, Muhammad saying, uh, where is Ubay? Uh, he, was, he was reading the Salat uh, in, in the Masjid. Um, and he says, where is Ubay after the Salat is over? Ubay says, I'm here. And he says, why didn't you remind me about the verse I forgot? And Ubay says, oh, when you didn't read it, I thought it had been abrogated. So here, Muhammad, on multiple accounts, we see Muhammad saying he's forgotten the Qur'an. It's very possible that people did not remember this verse. Uh, Zayd ibn Thabit specifically is mentioned. It's very possible he forgot a verse. If Muhammad forgets verses, so can Zayd. And he says, I know this verse exists, I just can't remember it. Let me look for it. And they find it with Abu Khuzayma, they find it with no one but him. So your explanation doesn't necessitate that you're right. And I think the actual words and my possible explanation make my explanation more strong. You said Ubay was alive and Mu'ad was alive. Um, I'll tell you, the source that I searched, uh, that I got this from, that Ubayi was dead, um, is, this was the reason that was given. Um, Mu'ad had been sent by Umar to go to Syria to teach the Qur'an. At this point, Ubayi was sick right before his death. Then, so that's why they didn't send Ubayi. They sent Mu'ad instead because Ubayi was sick. And they sent two other people as well. They go to Syria to teach the Qur'an while he was there. So Mu'ad was in Syria teaching the Qur'an, at which point he died. He dies in Syria. There is no mention of Uthman reporting the Qur'an um, before um, Mu'ad's death. And we know Ubayi died before Mu'ad. So that's why I'm saying they were all dead. If you say that they were alive, um, could you please read to me where they were alive? This was, this was my own research. So you have your sources. Um, I'll, I'll look for it later. Um, but this was my own research. So if you can show me they were still alive, great. However, it would still conclude two things. Number one. Ubayi was sick to the point of not being able to teach the Qur'an anymore, and Mu'ad was in Syria. In both cases, no one was present to respond to Uthman's Qur'an. So to say, oh, why weren't people responding? We still have that fulfilled. We still have that met. Mu'ad wasn't there. Ubayi was too sick to do anything about it. However, I think the uh, proper conclusion is that they were both dead. Um, if you show me sources to say otherwise, um, I, I would thank you for that, but I won't contradict my position. You're saying one ahruf is good enough. Muhammad himself said one ahruf is good enough. It's health giving. Uh, you can use that one ahruf. Any mode you use is okay. I'm not, I'm not contradicting that, Hassan. If Muhammad said that, great, he said that. But him saying one ahruf is good enough is not equal to saying you can destroy the others. It's you can follow one, sure, that's good enough for you, but these are also the words of God. It does not give him the right to destroy these other words of God. Uh, you, that's not, uh, it doesn't logically follow, it's non secular. You're saying Ibn Masud followed an old huff. Well, what we see from all the sources over and over again is Ibn Masud saying, This is the way I heard it from Muhammad's mouth. He says, When Zayd was still in the loins of a disbeliever, I heard from Muhammad's mouth 70 verses which I memorized. So over and over again, Ibn Masud is saying things that show he disagreed with the final version of the Quran. He disagreed with Zayd's Quran. He says it so many times, it's found in so many sources, that I find it shocking that you can simply gloss over them. Uh, so to say, oh, but that was the old hut, then he agreed to this new hut, I would like to see at least as many sources which say he agreed, um, and I don't think you've uh, shared those sources with us. <coughs> Finally, I just want to quote, uh, comment briefly on, oh, and I do want to mention the critical scholars, that he misrepresented what I said, but let me focus on this for now. Chapter 3, verse 120 of the Quran. He says he really doesn't know about this. And I respect his honesty again. I will gladly show him after the debate is over what I'm talking about. The Paris manuscript has not been widely published, so I didn't expect him really to know what I was talking about. But that's why I showed it on the screen. Um, 
He says, I would approach it this way. Are those variations currently present? If so, um, was it propagated? If not, was it just a scribal error? Notice, he's, a, he's telling us scribal errors are okay in the Quran. That's, that's one of my main points here. Um, that, that's one of my main points. As far as, oh, I guess I lost the audience here. My time's up. So we'll talk about things in the question and answer session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, we started half an hour late. Um, I think if we finish at four, unless there's any strong reason to descend from that, we can have a Q&A session and the two speakers can sum up. Um, so, will anyone put the uh, questions or comments to either of the speakers, please? Little lady, little girl is putting her hand up. Yes, sir, please. It's quite interesting to hear that he didn't conclude Surah number one, Surah Tanya and Musa, that after Jeffrey, in his environmental work, textual history, material textual history of the Quran, he actually cites variants from the same Surah. So if Ibn Masood did not include Surah Fatiha, or did not recite Surah Fatiha as part of the Quran, how does he have variants within the Surah? So you're saying Arthur Jeffrey quoted Ibn Masood's variants from um, Fatiha? Absolutely. From answering Islam too. Answering Islam that he, okay, well I'll take a look into that. Okay, Any more questions or comments at all? Father, um, Father Frank? No, the gentleman sitting in front of him with the glasses. I'm just curious why um, why you're not wanting to, to deal with the philosophical you know arguments. It's of the, not related uh, to the topic. But the fact because that because what what he's trying to show is that get the he's mic. trying to show get the mic. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't know you didn't hear. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually I actually am willing, but what I'm saying is that I'm going to keep it to the end. If I address everything, then I would address it because it's really not related. Because basically what, what Nabil is trying to say is that I find your concept of preservation to be logically incoherent. So here, what I'm trying to argue is that the Qur'an has been preserved the way Islam says it should. And that's what will keep all Muslims satisfied. But he's coming and saying your concept and understanding of preservation I find to be logically incoherent. I think that is a different topic. Because I'm trying to show, according to Islam, this is what we're supposed to have. He's trying to say, I don't find that to be logical. I think it's off topic. But if I do have time, I would, I would address it. But do you want me to address it? Sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a limit on... No, go ahead. No, but, but basically what I was trying to tell Nabil is that there is... Nabil, I gave my response. I said that God does not obligate its existence, but its application. Nabil is saying, yeah, but at the end of the day, you have this verse saying, uh, don't drink alcohol, and this other verse saying, don't drink alcohol if you're going to prayer, and they're there together. Isn't that a contradiction? No, because not, all, not both of them are being applied at the same time. Mm -hmm. After the Day of Judgment, almost all of these verses in the Quran are not going to be applicable anymore. I'm not going to fast in Ramadan in Paradise. I'm not going to perform Hajj in Paradise. But I still believe that they emanate from the from the eternal attribute of God, which is His speech. But I don't believe that they are going to be applied for eternity. So I don't, I don't see anything logically incoherent about that. And even if you still don't find it convincing, I'm still going to say it's not related to this topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, Hassan, um, I've got you down here as saying in your first uh, half, every single Muslim agreed with a version of Usman. Um, I hope I've got it right. Yeah. Um, well, that every single Muslim is a very large set. And in order to know that everybody agreed, you would have to have evidence that every single Muslim has been questioned. Now, if you said there is no evidence that anybody disagreed, I would go along with you uh, if that is the case. But there would be an argument from silence. And an argument from silence, logically, is a very weak argument. Uh, do you know Dr. William Lane Craig? Um, tell me. Okay, well he's one of the world's renowned, uh, he's a world-renowned Christian apologist, and he said, 
Sometimes the absence of evidence does constitute evidence of absence. Absence of evidence for entity X constitutes evidence of absence for entity X only if you were to expect to see evidence for entity X if it were to exist. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that if there were disagreements, we would definitely expect to see evidence for it because the early Muslims were known for narrating almost every single detail from anyone. We even know how many gray hairs the Prophet peace be upon him had on his beard. What more detail than you want than that? How many was that? Okay. Um, okay. It's their narration, okay? But the point I'm trying to say is that taking into consideration the way, the behavior of the early Muslims and how they used to narrate from the smallest, finest details, I would surely expect to see that there would have been uh, narrations talking about disputes. But it's still different from saying every statement argument in, in from a silence kind of... could be a valid positive argument. I understand where you're coming yeah. from. Not it, the statement that philosophers say is absence of evidence does not necessarily imply evidence of absence. However, sometimes it could, and I honestly believe. Uh, because uh, taking into consideration the early Muslims and how they narrated, I think you would agree with me, surely if there did exist such a such a matter, it would have been narrated down to us. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'd like to ask about the Ayatul Rajab, the verse of storing, please. Um, you say that Umar, he, he, he claimed that because we, you couldn't find the verse anymore in the Quran, later generations would not practice it. And this ties back the incident of uh, the goat eating the verse and thus making it abrogated. <coughs> the goat ate the verse after the prophet died. So what authority does the goat have to abrogate? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm sure you come, uh, I'm sure you came up to my first rebuttal. I'm sure I took care of that. First of all, Omar bin Khattab, when he said, I want to include the narration of the stoning into the Qur'an, that assumes that he already knew what it was. The goat eating that manuscript does not prove that it ate the only manuscript that contained this verse, nor does it mean that it messed up the memories of those who memorized the verse. And my friend, I have the verse of stoning with me today. I can show it to you. So I have it. Could you please, so, I'm sorry, could you please interpret that hadith? About the goat? About the goat. That's, that's my friend, right in front of you, my friend. That's what I'm talking about. We have every detail being narrated down to us. Even Aisha bothered to say, a goat came to the room and this manuscript. That's all, that's all that it says. You can't read more into it. So when Omar bin Khattab said, I, I want to have it included to the Quran, it's crucial. Because he said, I'm worried that people will not implement it anymore. What, Quran, what Nabil is trying to say is that Omar wanted to include it because he thought it was still part of the Qur'anic text and not abrogated. So that's what, Omar did not say that. That's what Nabil has to show. Right, so what is the significance of the goat eating? There is no significance. <laughs> what is the significance of the Prophet? We, we know that the Prophet urinated standing up. What's the significance to that? I know that the Prophet didn't like eating lizards. What's the significance to that? That's why I'm saying, if there are no narrations about a, a dispute it is good evidence that it didn't happen because they narrated every little detail to us. Pointless to yeah? So it was a pointless narration. Are there any questions on a non-goat related subject? <laughs> Please. Uh, for Nabil, uh, yeah. any questions for Nabil particularly? Yes, answer. Sorry, thank you for allowing me to ask a question again. I found that interesting your remark that Hassan has come up with a uh, sort of presentation about the primary preservation which is in sharp contrast with the general idea that is held by the majority of the Muslims. That Muslims believe the Quran is preserved even to the word and so on and so forth. But that is exactly the case. If you compare the Firaat, say the seven or the ten, the, uh, the Firaat that we say in Mutawata, take the examples of Hafs. The readings of Hafs or the Qira'ah of Hafs, is it any different in London, or in Egypt, or in Sudan, or in Somalia, any part of the globe? This particular reading, word for word, letter for letter, sound for sound, is recited exactly the same. So when we Muslims say the Quran has been preserved, we can say that the Quran has been preserved in each Qira'ah, and each Qira'ah that we accept as from God is Qira'ah that has a 
correct chain of narrations back to the professional knowledge document in multiple chains of transmission. If you compare the the era, or reading of Wash, which you, you cited earlier, this is exactly the case with this reading as well. Wash era is recited wherever it's recited, because people in, in, in central London they recite the Wash era as well. If you compare this Wash era, whether it's a manuscript or reading, it's recited exactly word for word, letter for letter, sound for sound, in all part of the Muslim code. That's what we mean by Quranic preservation, perfect preservation. Can I ask a uh, clarification? Are you saying it's it's pronounced the same within that hubs? Uh, I mean, within that transmission? Like every, every single tara on its own has been preserved on its own. And this day on its own as well. On its own. Okay. See, I think this is where we we seem to have come to an impasse. There's a lot of things I'm not disagreeing with. I'm just clarifying that they're here. Um, and if people laugh when I said this, but I'm I'm just trying to emphasize a few points. The fact that he agrees with me on these points. Um, shows that what I tried to do has been done. For example, I tried to show that there are different words, different letters and whatnot that can be used within the Quran. He said it's okay because we have different transmissions, hops and wash. I'm saying, okay, good. Thanks for conceding what I had already wanted to have been said. That's it. I just wanted to show that there were different words, different letters, different ways the Quran has been transmitted. So you're saying, oh, it's okay. Um, within the within that transmission, it's the same everywhere and always. Okay, but I'm saying that there's multiple transmissions. When that is what is indicative of other books, we have multiple transmissions of other books. For example, the biblical texts. We have families, uh, we have Alexandrian families, Byzantine families, Western families of the Bible. So we have different transmissions. I'm just trying to show the Quran is the same. Are they of equal status in its authenticity and acceptability? Because in the Quran, I'm sure you know, each qira'a, each recitation, are of equal status. We don't delegate them to a footnote, but if you look at the Alexandrian and the Byzantine text you mentioned, they're not of equal status. So the Quran is unlike any other you, book on I, this issue. I think you're, um, you're drawing a false parallel here. In the case of... In, exactly. No, I, I, in, in the case of uh, the different transmissions in the Bible, uh, we don't need to have a uh, divine command on how to, how to observe these different transmissions. We can deduce from our own intellect what we think about these transmissions. I think when historians apply that same criteria, which they apply to every other book, to the Quran, they come up with the same conclusions. Now, if you're going to a uh, theological position where, oh, in Islam it's okay to have these different transmissions, I'm saying that's separate, just like he's saying. That's a theological issue. I'm talking about the textual issues, and textually speaking, it's the same phenomenon. Okay, um, we're now going to move to the uh, closing statements. Bassam will start with his five minutes closing statement, followed by Nabil, and, uh, and then we will uh, break. Uh, for those of us who are coming back, just to remind you, our grand finale, grand finale starts at 5.15, same place uh, here at quarter past five. Thank you. Okay, uh, you, you're asking for the, uh, the, the source for Obey still being selected for the committee. It's actually one of your favorite sources. It's uh, in Nabi Dawood's Kitab al page 33. And uh, Ibn Kathir said that it has a Sahih in this map. Um, uh, in Nabi Dawood, Kitab al page 33, Ibn Kathir said it has a Sahih in this map. Uh, you're saying that. I think I heard you say that with the New Testament variants, they, they don't affect doctrine. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you to go to Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman's book, The Text of the New Testament, Transmission, Corruption, Restoration, pages 200, page 285, and show the different uh, issues of doctrine that they have said are affected by textual variants. For example, um, the gospel, could the Gospels have been used to support adoptionistic Christology, or one of anti or did Luke include the doctrine of atonement, or whether members of the Jovanian community embraced the Gnostic Christology? So your textual variants do affect uh, key issues of doctrine, ours don't. Um, and no, I did not say scribal errors are okay, Nabil. What I was saying is that of course scribal errors did exist in our manuscripts, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying it became a part of a transmission and recitation of the Quran. Um, you're saying that but Ibn Mas'ud uh, Ibn Mas'ud is Muhammad's greatest, te greatest teacher. He said there were no 113 and 114. Yeah, but who is the bigger authority than Ibn Mas'ud? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Come on. Um, uh, you, you, you said Ibn Mas'ud said, maintain your Qur'ans and don't go with Uthman. 
Uh, I don't know if you paid attention in my, uh, in my rebuttals, but I said this was part of a mistranslation. Ibn Masood, according to the Arabic, was actually saying, I was exempted from being, part, uh, from being selected from the committee, and someone else was being selected. Yes, I know, it's a gross mistranslation, but I can explain it to you if you want later on, if you know Arabic. Um, you're saying Zaid possibly searched for what he forgot. I'll grant you that. It's, it's possible, but I don't know if you could prove that, because the narration said, when we wrote the Holy Quran, I missed one of the verses of Surah Al-Ahzab, which I used to hear Allah's Apostle recite. To me, it kind of sounds like he's saying that he knows what the verse is. Um, but again, my interpretation could be possible, yours could be possible, but I think mine is stronger since I have two scholars from the first century that agree with me. You don't have anyone. Um, you're saying... Uh, okay, fine, fine. All right, I'm, I'm just going to close this. I'm gonna Okay, I'm going to refute one more argument, sorry. <laughs> he gave a narration where it said, uh, Ubay said that he's not willing to let go of some of the narrations. First of all, Ubay wanted to personally retain everything for himself, including the obligated revelations. He did not say that others had to do the same. It was his personal choice. Secondly, nowhere do we see that Ubay imposed upon anyone else to do what he did. For if he believed that the Muslims were not reciting what was meant to be recited, then he sure, surely would have spoken out. Thirdly, just because the text of Ubay contained the verse of stoning, for example, that does not follow that he did not regard it to be obligated, let alone that he wanted the whole Muslim community to recite it that way. Fourthly, most importantly, Ubay was part of the committee selected by Uthman, and he agreed with all of the other members of the committee on the final Uthmanic text. So what do we see? We see that the qiraat that we have today, the variants that we have today, are approved by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that the companions all used to recite them, which is all that matters at the end of the day. And we see that Nabil took narrations, made a mountain out of a molehill out of them, introduced red herrings, appealed to weak sources, imposing his personal beliefs and ignoring Islamic teachings, uh, uh, appealed to narrations, gave misleading interpretations about them, did double standards, appealed to faulty translations, mishandled the narrations, did not consider historical context, and did, uh, I'm not going to mention the factual error because you said you had your own narration on that. So let me close by saying, praise be to Allah, our magnificent creator, who has ensured that today we have access to his fully preserved and final revelation to mankind. The next step for us to take right now is to get hold of a copy of the Quran and approach it with the intention of seeking the truth and seeking God. If you do so with an open mind and an open heart, I guarantee you that Allah will guide you to this beautiful religion where you will find true peace and attain salvation. Thank you very much. Okay, Nabil, you have your five minutes. Thank you very much, Bassam, for your position. I really enjoyed this debate. I think when uh, I go back, I will look at everything Sam had to say and study it, investigate it. Perhaps after we study each other's positions some more, we can uh, debate this topic again in the future. This time we'll have more equal ground on uh, what each other is saying uh, so we can investigate it at home. I do want to clarify uh, some things for everyone here. Um, I think there were plenty of um, places where we misconstrued what the other person was saying. I'm sure I am guilty of it too. Uh, but one point that I want to quote is from uh, Yasser Qadi on page 128 of his book. Al-Bukhari mentions Anas ibn Malik as saying that only four people memorized the Qur'an before the Prophet's death. So I'm just quoting exactly as Yasir Qadi says. Now, if he's saying Yasir Qadi said it wrong, I, I, I think that's kind of hard to believe when it comes to interpreting the Hadith. I don't agree with all his conclusions on the Hadith, but when it comes to interpreting the meaning of the Hadith, I think he's pretty solid. That's why I'm invited to a good scholar. So uh, I, I don't think that was sufficiently dealt with. Dealt with. And he says that the concept of the preservation of the Qur'an, the tablet in heaven, is a different topic. I thought we were talking about the preservation of the Qur'an. Uh, I mean, when, when we're trying to talk about the definition of preservation, I think it's appropriate to see what Islam teaches about that. Now, he takes offense when I do not talk about theological things. He's saying, oh, he doesn't take into account Islamic teaching. He ignores what Islamic teachings, theology says about the Qur'an. Uh, yes, because that's an issue of the actual preservation itself. But you have a double standard here. You're saying in one time uh, you're ignoring the Islamic teaching, shame on you. Oh, at other points you are accepting the Islamic teaching, shame on you. You can't have both. Um, I, think, I think clearly it's important to talk about the Islamic definition of preservation in this kind of debate, but it's not appropriate to take the way Islam interprets these uh, variant texts 
um, because we're approaching that more objectively. You said there's a contradiction about, uh, when I mentioned various things about alcohol that's found in the uh, Quran, you said, oh, the first one and the second ones are not contradictions because they both don't apply. I'm not talking about a contradiction application. I'm talking about contradiction in the text. Again, I'm not going to theology, I'm going to the text. Clearly the text contradicts each other, though the application may not. My whole point in bringing this up was that abrogation seems to be a concept whereby you can excuse contradictions in the text. Um, this, to any objective observer, would seem to be um, basically a way out, an escape clause, if you will. He said, we don't see any disagreements from the early people. I'm telling you, we see disagreements in many sources. Let me quote one here. Um, it says, Hudayfa said, the Kufans say, use the text of Abdullah, and the Basmans say, the text of Abu Musa, by God. If I reach the command of the faithful, I will recommend that he drown these readings. Abdullah responds by saying, do that, and God will drown you, but not in water. What is this? This is a disagreement. Abdullah basically says, you do that, you're going to hell. They're disagreeing with each other on the very readings, what to do with them. Um, this is a disagreement of the highest degree, and to the point where one believer can say to another, you're going to go to hell for saying that. Uh, so we do have disagreements, we have them all over the place. You said, Omar did not want to include the verse on stoning. I showed you already in Asayyuti, he clearly says that I would include it if I could not be accused of adding to the word of God. And you're saying, even if scribal errors exist, you're saying, I, I, I think you didn't understand me at this point. I said, you said it was okay that scribal errors exist. Not that they're propagated. I mean, what you are trying to say is that if there's a scribal error, it's just contained in that one spot. And therefore, it's not really a problem. That's what you're trying to say. I'm just saying that He's okay with a scribal error being in a specific spot. Again, I don't disagree with him on these things. I'm just trying to show you what we both agree on. <clears throat> in conclusion, I just want to say the following things. When we look at the text of the Quran, it seems that he and I agree on a lot of things. We agree that there can be scribal errors. We agree that people had disagreements before Uthman's time about what should be included. We agree that Ibn Masud didn't include certain verses. We agree things on various accounts. The difference we have is the conclusion. I'm not coming at this from an Islamic standpoint. I'm coming at this from an objective standpoint. I'm saying all these variations, pre-Uthmanic, post-Uthmanic, variations in chapters, variations in verses, variations within verses, variations in words, contradictions, will surely, will surely not. These kinds of things, he can explain theologically. I'm saying any objective observer who comes to this will say, these are the same things we find in other books. That was my whole point. I think that has been conceded by both sides, that has been agreed upon. I am not trying to say the Quran is horribly corrupt. I would never try to say that. I think it's a very well-preserved book, but not 100%, not perfect, the way that Muslims would tend to believe. In the end, I would just like to invite everyone to continue to investigate this on their own behalf. Neither of us are scholars. Neither of us have PhDs in this issue. We're going to continue to learn. I invite everyone to please look into these things by your own self so that we can continue to have this scholarly discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sam and Nabil, for what I think was a truly excellent uh, discussion this afternoon. Just to remind you, the grand finale debate will be in this room at quarter past five this afternoon. It is entitled The Concept of God in Islam and in Christianity. David Wojtow will be participating in that along with Abdullah as well. So hopefully see you soon. Thank you.